Okay. So Hi, let Lynn. me, I'll go ahead and introduce you. So this, welcome Hillary Douglas, who has a master's in visual art. Well, she's working on her PhD. Why don't I follow the script? Hillary Douglas is a visual art, art integration specialist with the Opening Minds Through the Arts, the OMA program at Tucson Unified School District. She is a second year student in the AVCE doctoral program and has 16 years of experience teaching art in school, museum, and community settings. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. It's so nice to see all of you. I'll be presenting today on arts integration and social and emotional learning. Again, my name is Hillary Douglas. So this project I've worked on is in collaboration with the Arizona Department of Education and also with the OMA Opening Minds Through the Arts Program at Tucson Unified School District. Um, so I work for, again, the Opening Minds Through the Arts OMA Program at Tucson Unified School District. It is an arts integrated program. So we teach visual arts, but we also use it as a vehicle uh, for the instruction of academic standards related to science, math, um, technology, social studies, language acquisition, um, ELA, and um, et cetera. So uh, we ha do have all of the fine arts in the OMA program. We have uh, music, opera, um, dance, and uh, musical instruments, choral, um, all of the fine arts are included, but I'll mainly today be talking about the visual arts. So this is my newsletter that I give out to students at the beginning of the year, introducing them to OMA and what art integration is. And yeah, so uh, through my work with the OMA program, I was actually recommended to work with the Arizona State Department of Education. They needed a project manager. Uh, to help update their digital online resources for uh, social and emotional learning or SEL. So the collaborative for academic social and emotional learning uh, describes SEL or, uh, as a framework for uh, a process for how uh, students learn about self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision-making and self-management um, in schools, classrooms, and their homes in the community. So it's often illustrated by this wheel, we call it the CASO wheel uh, or SEL wheel, um, which really shows, uh, it's kind of just a, it's a framework, you know, like a guideline of uh, what students should be learning about themselves and others. So Arizona has um, some general guidelines uh, about social and emotional learning in education settings. Um, the, Oh, and this is actual research, by the way. So um, I responded to this quote about action research, uh, really in that it helps to bring out underlying curriculum philosophies um, for teachers and it is participatory um, and kind of to just kind of discover underlying like themes in what we do. Uh, so this is action research. So anyway, the, um, the ADE does have some resources or did have some resources available for SEL and the arts. Uh, they kind of have what they call a handbook. So you can go to their website and you can click what you're interested in, in terms of the fine arts. Um, you can click the art processes that come from the 2015 Arizona State Standards. You can click the rubric grade band. And then it spits back at you what it calls a handbook, which is a lot of words. It's a lot of words. Um, they connect, you know, they, they pull up some standards for you, but they don't really give you a lot of practical information about how teachers, especially new teachers, could really implement or be focusing on social and emotional learning in their classrooms. Uh, so, um, when, before I was doing this project, or I got involved with this project too, I was doing some social and emotional stuff in my lesson plans. Uh, this is an example of a lesson plan I wrote last year during online learning. And you can see I'm actually citing Ohio's uh, K-12 social and emotional learning standards. Arizona still does not have social and emotional learning standards per se, but we are developing more resources um, around this area. And hopefully someday we'll have some, some standards of our own. I really like Ohio, so they work great. Um, they really connect to what I was doing. They give me ideas. Um, and that's a really good resource, I think, for someone in Arizona who is like, I don't know where to look for information about social and emotional learning. Um, yeah, so a group of us were actually asked 
to be involved in this project with the ADE from all over Arizona. So I served as project manager and that I just kind of kept the files, like online files organized and made sure everyone was kind of getting the work done in a timely fashion. Uh, but you can see we have visual artists. We also have dance, theater, music. And then we had a group of uh, wonderful ad people who served as admin in their districts who provided insight as well. So we each met several times over the summer in our individual cohorts. So I worked with the visual arts people, meeting with them and working on the resources with them. Um, dance met separately, theater met separately and so on. But then we would periodically have large group meetings in which we would kind of review what was going on. So in the beginning of the project, we all got together and we just kind of brainstormed, <coughs> excuse me, what we needed to do, what we wanted to do. Um, our ADE contact, Dustin Lower, was very open uh, to our input and ideas. She kind of recognized us as being experts in this area and really wanted to know what we thought would be would be helpful. So you can see up here, you know, people created these little like post-its when they thought of something. Um, and then we would like write check marks next to them if we really, really liked them. So you can, I think you can see that like lesson plans are very popular. Um, yes, lesson plans, um, guides, things like that. Um, we came up with a list of deliverables for our time together. This project ran from June and then ended towards the end of July for phase one. We're now in phase two of the project in which we're like refining and reformatting a lot of our documentation. And we are also talking about phase three, which I can tell a little bit more about at the end of the presentation. Um, yeah, so we decided that in each of our groups, in each of our fine arts groups, we would come up with lesson plans that connected each artistic discipline uh, to SEL competencies. We decided we would create templates and guides to help with lesson planning for SEL. Uh, we decided to create a list of trauma-informed opening and closing rituals, which were really like classroom management strategies. And we also decided to try and collect video examples of students, teacher testimony, and like micro trainings or like little PD things, professional development things. Um, yeah, and that was what we decided to work on together and separately in our groups. Uh, so this is one of the artifacts that my visual arts group created. And it is a giant matrix of ideas for lesson plans that connect each of, so on the top there's each of the SEL competencies, so self-management, self-awareness, um, et cetera. And then on the side, there are each of the art processes that should be familiar from the 2015 Arizona State Standards. So we have creating, uh, presenting, responding, and connecting. So where they hit each other, where they, where they intersect on the matrix, uh, there's an idea of something that an art teacher could do with their students to both connect and teach responsible decision-making, you know, or both present and uh, work on self-awareness with students. So there's three grade bands um, present in this matrix. I worked on the elementary level. Uh, my colleague, Kellyanne, worked on middle school. And then my colleague, Dr. Linda Brett, worked on high school. Um, in our new revisions, we are going to be adding a fourth grade grade band for the little littles for the um, like kinder kinder pre K and K. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's one of our artifacts. And actually, all of the groups music, dance, um, theater, etc. We all made a matrix like this, uh, so that a new teacher could come in and be like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how these things connect, and just have tangible examples of what to do. We also created some lesson plans. Uh, this is a lesson plan that I had already done. It's actually the same as the, the one previously I showed you. Uh, I still got the Ohio standards here for SEL. <laughs> um, but yeah, we put them into the ADE format. We are gonna be reformatting them one more time, uh, but we wanted to have, and these, and these lessons are in the matrix. So someone could be like, oh, I see that lesson, I like it. And then have the corresponding like really detailed lesson plan that they could draw from as well. Um, yeah, so I've been doing some research and reading on um, arts integration and SEL. Um, it's so interesting because I even just had a co uh, conversation with my supervisor the other day. We have a lot of new people working for our program. She was very concerned that they weren't 
integrating. They were not doing the academics alongside the arts and she was worried about, you know, potentially having funding pulled. And it's real, it is a real concern um, that, uh, you know, you know, she was, she even cited an example. She was like the dance, there was dance teachers and someone was like, I don't even care. Just get the kids moving in the classroom. She was like, that's not what we do. You know, we're also teaching them, you know, addition and subtraction through movement, you know, and um, just that, that kind of uh, pull towards using arts integration to validate the art is, is very, very real. Um, so I've been reading that actually a balance between arts integration and self-expression is very helpful. Um, it's helpful in the schools because you know these 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 aspects of formalism can kind of legitimize and like make things easy to assess and evaluate. Um, and then also because the self-expression is just it's fun, it's personal, you know. Um, yeah. So here are some examples of th some things I've been doing in the classroom. I am teaching first or fifth grade, sorry. I'm teaching fifth grade for the first time actually ever. I've taught sixth grade before, but I had never taught fifth grade. Um, and I'm so excited. We're doing so many fun things, but here are a couple projects that I just like to share with you. Uh, Cause I think they really kind of pull out this idea of integration, but also social and emotional learning, self-expression. Um, so this is a project we started and finished in like August, September in fifth grade. I give the students uh, what I call a planning page for each project. We were talking about perspective, drawing 3D objects and spaces in 2D so that they appear to look realistic. And this is the front of the page. This is the back of the page. And this is where I kind of highlight and like pull out um, what the academics are that I'm focused on in the lesson. So in this lesson, it was on place value. Students in fifth grade are learning place value, not just for whole numbers anymore, but also for um, decimal points and parts of the whole. So uh, you can see here on the bottom, they do a little practice drawing. They're thinking about perspective and then also the vanishing point becomes a decimal point. It's like a visual illustration. And then down here where it says number four, you can kind of see that they label each building has its own place value um, for the whole numbers and then also for the decimal points. Um, we have to have a long conversation about how there's no one place, <laughs> which is always fun. Um, yeah, and so this is kind of where I, I, I bring it all together with, with the ac academic side of things. Um, but uh, honestly, for me, as someone who, you know, I'm not a, an, a visual artist, but I'm an art teacher, I'm kind of art forward. Um, this, is, this is a little bit secondary for me, but I do this so that on paper, you know, for, for the powers that be and provide the funding, they see, they see that I'm doing this. Uh, but then also you can see some of the results. So this is by Brianna, she is wonderful. Um, and you can see she's working, she actually finished more of this after I took this picture, um, but and it's just been so tough right now in the school, some students are, there's a lot of student absences <laughs> going on. So sometimes things don't get finished, but you can see that she, she did the thing. She created the buildings. She made at least four buildings on each side. Like we talked about, she's got a vanishing point. Her buildings are receding in space. She's got windows on each one. Uh, which is how we would de determine a number uh, for each of the um, place values. But then she's also considering um, stores and consumerism and what kinds of things she would want on like a dream street if she had one, you know? She's really into monsters. She also drew monsters. And, um, you know, I really, it's really important to me that the kids get to make their own decisions and kind of show off their own personalities through their art. So someone who was looking at this might not be like, oh, place value. Uh, they would probably, for me, I first noticed, you know, the choices that the kids make and the individual um, decisions that they make in their artwork. Here's another one of the same project. This is by uh, Jaden. And again, you can see exploring um, communities. So funny. I did not expect it, but like when we did this project, 
a lot of them ended up turning out just like little mini maps of the Irvington um, shopping mall plaza, <laughs> which is down the street from the school. Um, so next time I do it, I might say no real stores, but it is just kind of interesting to see how how they think of it, you know, like what their favorite stores are. And, and then of course, we've got this guy up here where he's exploring something very personal. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's amazing that he has an outlet to do that. And, and that can happen, even if your focus is technically on the academic content. Uh, let's see, so we've got another one. This is a project that we're finishing up right now with fifth grade. Uh, we're working on fractals. So I was interested in fractals uh, because of the way that they visually show expo exponents, which is a fifth grade concept they're working on in math. Um, and we thought, or I thought to do a really simple fractal design with the kids. So we, we focused on Sierpinski triangles and you can see some of the work down below where each level, each time we draw new triangles, it increases exponentially. So they have to write uh, write the numbers that that express that as well. Vocabulary, we're doing that too. Um, and then here's some of the results. So I told them that in their designs they could paint, but then they would also add, and you can see it here too, on number three, they created little texture patterns. And I encouraged them to create texture patterns out of symbols that really spoke to them. Um, we talked about what the fractal could represent. You know, we looked at lots of pictures of fractals from nature, and we thought about forever, infinity, um, eternity. And so we, in our um, little patterns, um, wanted to create something that, that maybe corresponded with those ideas for us. Uh, so this is Santi, and you can see how much she loves baseball, sports, uh, even. Um, and then this is by Dominic, and you can see how much this child, he loves his dog. His do I was like, who's Zeke? He's like, that's my dog. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can see that there too. So even though this is technically on paper, academic integration, you can also, there's evidence that students are making their own choices, making decisions, and exploring personal themes in their artwork. Uh, I presented some of this information um, mostly, not my project examples, but mostly connected to uh, the matrix I showed you before at the Arts and PE Virtual Summit back in September. That was through the, the Arizona State Department of Education. And this is just some hard data, which is kind of fun to show. <laughs> um, you can see down at the bottom, we've got 94% who attended this session thought it was accurate, and then 87.5% would attend another session. So there is some interest in this topic, and a lot of the teachers I uh, have spoken to have been very interested to get their hands on the matrix and the lesson plans. They want them badly, um, but of course, they will probably not be released until uh, probably, I think they said June or July of 22, and they're still being polished up and reformatted right now. Uh, so we are also in talks with ADE, OMA, the OMA program that I work for, and then also um, the Flynn Foundation for phase three of the project. Uh, the Flynn Foundation um, would like to give some money to um, work on a case study with SEL and the arts. They're interested in partnering with a community organization in Tucson and with the OMA program and seeing what is possible. So um, some of us are gonna have a meeting about it in a little bit, like maybe in a, within the month, and we might have some more information about how that might, might go on. Yeah, so I just wanted to pause for a moment. I have um, another section of the presentation, but I just wanted to see if anyone had any questions. <laughs> Moving I'm on. sorry, I do have oh, a question. <laughs> sorry, I couldn't get my mute thing unmuted. Um, <laughs> no, I, you, you mentioned that you are not directly an artist. Hmm. Did, yeah. did you say that? I think I did. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I kind of I'm with you there that I'm coming into this like program in this kind of um, uh, um, education without um, an artist background. So I'm, I'm looking to use art in the same ways that you are using art to learn, to teach. Mm. And um, 
I was wondering, um, like, were there externally outside of these like committees and things that you've been on in, and the work that you've actually done in the classroom, are there any um, scholars or anyone that you've been looking to who are um, developing arts integrated learning or any of these practices that you're, you're using? So I have many colleagues at the OMA mm -hmm. program and we're all doing, we're all doing arts integration. It's an arts integration program, um, particularly uh, also I'm looking at not just arts integration, but the STEAM and STEM program. Okay. Uh, are of interest to me um, in the ways that they use arts integration as well. So I did cite uh, Halverson and Lashley uh, article in my presentation, mm -hmm. and those are two scholars uh, that I'm looking at at the moment. Um, okay. There's another article I've been reading as well about assessment and for SEL and how that works or could work better. Awesome. Thank you. And, and just knowing some of those like kind of keywords of things that you're looking for is also helpful and saying things. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, I prepared a presentation uh, for the students in ART 150 and they, it's a class on children's art. And so I wanted to share a lot. Of, I just wanted to share a lot of pictures and projects with them of things that my students do. So I thought I'd share with that with you too. Um, yeah, so here it comes. So it starts kind of um, backwards in time. So this is again, my newsletter. <laughs> Let's see, slideshow and play. Um, so I shared this quote with Audre Lorde uh, with the students. Um, one of the um, topics the class was discussing was multicultural education. And this uh, quote really stood out to me, the sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual, forms a bridge between the sharers, which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between them and lessens the threat of their difference. So, and then, yes, so then again, here's my newsletter. I work for the OMA program. Um, I start the year every year by making portfolios with my students and we make them out of paper bags. So the students cut the, the bottom corner off a bag, they flatten it out, and um, then they, they design it. And this is a point in the semester when I tell students they can do whatever they want. They have to put their name, they have to write the word OMA, and they have to write portfolio in the year, but then otherwise I encourage them to draw, you know, whatever they want, things that represent them, things they love, um, things that really inspire them. So, I just love this one with baby animals. And these are from this year, uh, specifically. One year we had OMA stickers, so we put those on instead of writing OMA. Uh, this is the same Brianna uh, from the street with the monster. <laughs> Uh, this is a project I do with first graders. Um, in the children's art class, they were talking about modern art and connections between children's art and modern art. Um, this is one where we look at the work of Kandinsky and students paint a warm side and a cool side of their paper and they use shapes. They sort them on the warm side or the cool side. They, sort, they have 10 shapes and then they create a, an addition uh, problem within uh, base 10. So it is really fun to see them all hung up and they really, they really do connect with modern art. <laughs> this is a, a project that I do with parts of the plants. And this is a science uh, thing that first graders do. Uh, they actually get little seeds in their science kits and then they, they plant them. Um, so we talk about the plant parts. We sing head, shoulders, knees, and toes um, with the plant parts, flower, leaf, stem, and roots. Uh, and then I have them fold a piece of paper in half, and then they can draw between, I think, three and five flowers or plants. We talk about all different kinds of plants. Uh, then they color the bottom of their paper, and then, um, and then we paint it black and scratch out. So the invisible part of the, we talk about the invisible part of the plant we can't see is the roots. 
Uh, but with this special kind of, you know, technique scratch art, we can we can be X-ray vision people and, and see the roots. Uh, so the kids draw things like seeds as well, roots, all different kinds of things underground. I love these flowers because I really think they look like they remind me of cactuses with the thick stems. <laughs> Uh, and then here, the, I do these little cards, uh, and this is like similar to the fifth graders with their planning pages. For the younger students, I just do a little baby card that just has a couple of things. Um, so they label the parts of their plants, and then they also create an addition problem, adding flowers, stems, leaves for a total. This is something I do with students sometimes right before um, holiday break. Uh, I call it circle weaving. So they have a little cardboard circle, they have yarn, and they actually have to count as they move the string. So it's good reinforcement for that. And it's great because they'll just sit on the carpet and keep, keep themselves busy weaving for a while. It creates this little strand, um, like a braid in the middle. Uh, this is a little project I did in ceramics with students where we rolled out clay tiles and they used Legos, which they thought was awesome, uh, to stamp designs. So the Lego, the Lego designs actually create little arrays um, in, of circles. And the third graders are studying multi multiplication uh, with arrays. And so they use parts of their design to write multiplication problems, which you can see uh, on their planning pages on the other side. Pinch pots with first graders. Uh, most of the students, we have to have a long conversation about um, Play-Doh and is clay Play-Doh uh, because they've never encountered it before. They think it's Play-Doh. So we talk about how it comes from the earth and all of the um, cycles and processes for firing. So these are all different schools I'm showing you right now. Um, I have taught I did teach itinerantly in GUSD, and I've taught at Cabot, Sam Hughes, Dietz, uh, VC Elementary, Warren Elementary, <laughs> quite a few schools. So with this project, with the pinch pots, they also create a strand of beads. They make 10 and paint them different colors and create an addition problem to go along with them. So that belongs with the other project, but... Um, Big fan of these uh, cake temp temper paints. Uh, and also um, so, many so many strategies for managing uh, our art supplies in the classroom. Uh, one that's really working are these buckets with the holes drilled in them so the kids don't lose their brushes in the water. You can just see how into it they get too. This is a tile project I did at Sam Hughes. I collaborated with a gardening teacher. She wanted to make labels for all of the plants. And so the students had the tiles. They used um, underglazed pencils and liquid uh, underglazes to do the surface design. Each student was assigned a plant and had to go outside and look at it and research it and, and then come up with their tile design. Uh, this is a project I do in third grade where the students get six uh, circles, two of each color. We did um, secondary colors for this one. They cut each circle into six pieces. And we talk a lot about multiplication with the number six. And then they create a, a design using radial symmetry. Um, and they have a choice of their, we talk about value and they have a choice of black, gray, or white for their background. I have a lot of these pictures, but they, every time I do this, sometimes I feel like I'm bored with this lesson and every time I do it again, the students just surprise me. Um, someone always does something I've never seen before. Uh, this is a first grade lesson I do with Where the Wild Things Are. We read the story and we talk about the textures in the monsters, uh, fur. They use templates to draw the monster parts and then oil pastels to create various textures. We cut out the parts and then we make them into puppets. 
uh, the students write a, a short three line uh, poem about their monster. Monsters. Uh, this is a lesson I have done only once, but it has to do with carp kites and connecting to Children's Day in Japan. We read a story called Carp Kite or Carp, Carp Kite for Kamiko by Virginia Kroll. And then the students, I think in this case, they created either a warm or cool colored carp kite. These are animal drawings, which I could look at all day. I love them. Uh, this is for a fundraiser at Sam Hughes. The teachers wanted something that they could submit to this online program where they print things on coffee mugs and t-shirts or bags or whatever um, to raise money for the school. And I thought we would do animals uh, because who's an animal on their coffee mug or t-shirt. And the students, I, I don't really tell the students too much about what to do. I actually had a conversation with my supervisor about this. She was not as thrilled that there was no clear, from her perspective, academic integration. Although I did say, you know, we talk about um, emphasis, putting something in the middle of the paper, making it big. I mean, that is not just something that applies to art that can apply to many aspects of life. Um, but it's hard to really argue with these results. I mean, they're amazing. Um, yeah, they speak for themselves. This is a key pairing project. We read the story, um, The Boy Who Just Kept Trying by Kay Herring, his sister, which is a great, great story. I love it. Uh, I have it checked out from the library um, almost all year, typically. And um, so we talk about movement and students draw stick figures. Uh, we use giant uh, crayons to draw them. And so we make them really thick. Um, and then students add little lines to show movement. Uh, they count the, so each of the colors are supposed to have the same number of movement lines so that they can do multiplication with grouping. Um, this was by a student for the same project who didn't want to do it. Um, I came around the classroom and she was actually angrily drawing um, lines and circles on her paper. Um, and I just said, hey, you know, it'd be really great if you joined us. Kept walking around the room, came back, and she had turned all the people into little sons. And I, I, I and there's someone in the middle. I don't know. It, it, I just found it to be quite stunning. This uh, child had an IEP. It didn't really tell me too much um, besides the fact that she needed someone to hold her hand when she crossed the street. Uh, but I would often come into the room and she would be under her desk. She would be interruptive, shouting out. Um, and it was just really exciting to see her shine. So primary colors, obviously, for this one too, we talked about. Um, but I just get so excited. You know, I, I don't tell them necessarily. I don't coach them through their decisions always. So it's just so fun to see what comes up. Um, I think after a while, I started to tell them they could add symbols to their work between one and three symbols. We talked about those. Um, for example, the student made his own choice to make some of his figures bigger and some smaller for some interesting results. Uh, this is a color wheel project. And I've done color wheels a couple ways with time and also with fractions. Um, but the students create a color wheel and then um, turn it into something from their imagination or something that they've seen in real life. This one's not finished, but I just loved it. Um, with the color wheels as a barbell with a strong man. <laughs> and then we've got some online learning photos. So it was really hard. Online learning was very difficult, but we also had a lot of fun. Um, these are playground designs. So I know we're getting close to um, 11.45 and I'm not sure if you want me to stop or just keep going. <laughs> you 
because I know you said to do 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, I think um, if we ask um, if anyone has any questions, then if not, you can just keep going until 11.45. Okay. Anyone have anything um, to ask or to say? Any so, comment? Hillary, are you at one school? Or are you are you popping into several schools doing this? So up until this year, I was I was going to multiple schools, and this year, because of funding um, from COVID, uh, I am now just at one school, and I'm at VC Elementary School, which is way out on. Kinney and Ajo. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine how difficult. It is. So when you're planning, you're just doing your, you have other people that are working with you to do these lesson plans, which I think is. So typically, they're, typically I write my own lesson plans, but we do have a collaborative approach at the OMA program and we do share ideas. These are original. Well, the, in the first presentation, those are mine that I'm sharing with you. Second presentation, some of those have, are ones that we have shared. So Hillary, Hello. Hillary, you, oh. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Uh, so it's, it looks like uh, you are having so many kids in the classroom. So uh, even like social emotional learning is a lot of like attention individual attention should my need. So how are you gonna deal with this kind of like, a, you know, every day, so many kids, and then also you are trying to care for the students. So it might be a big challenge, but actually, so how you actually you kind of like address that or just kind of you are consciously mindful about this and just can you share like your secret, how are you gonna deal with that? Like you might wanna. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's hard. Um, I also love the kids. I really do. They're so much fun. And we, you know, over time, it's interesting because my program has hired a lot of new people recently. And it's like a lot of them are having trouble with classroom management. Um, I have also worked with so many teachers with the OMA program teaching in their classrooms. I've gotten to observe a lot of strategies um, for, for helping kids in the classroom. Um, I try, I, I do a lot of different things um, and I'm constantly trying new things. And I think that is what I would recommend to anyone who, who's teaching. Um, you know, I think a lot of people try something, they think that they've been told that's the way to do it. it and it maybe it doesn't work for them, but they keep doing it. And, and there's just, I mean, and now with like, you know, the internet and social media and sharing things, and there's just so many ways to do things. And even with me, what I do with one class might not work with another class. And so I'm always shifting and pivoting. Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, as follow-up questions, are you interested in continuing this kind of research like a future or are you just kind of like a more like a, you do like as action research? So, I mean, like a, I'm thinking about, are you interested in more like this kind of research for your dissertation or just like more your action research in practice? Which direction? No, I'm thinking maybe for maybe as a dissertation topic. It could um, be. I'm doing it for sure, uh, <laughs> but I I am I'm excited to to get deeper with it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of a lot of articles I'm pulling up right now are very current on this topic. Um, I think you know because of COVID, it has become really clear how essential it is uh, to focus on um, self-expression and personal and interpersonal learning. Um, in addition to, in addition to the, just like the concepts, the academic concepts all the time. So yeah, the reason I ask this question, so if you are continuing this kind of research, there's like a national um, research group right now formed this year. Oh, great. They are working on like social emotional learning and Carrie Friedemann, Juan Carlos and Lisa Hochtrick, she's from faculty of U of A. And also I'm kind of like part of that kind of the grant. and. So they have done a lot, even Steve Carpenter too. So they're trying to put it in some way, uh, data or metadata about social emotional learning. 
And then uh, I might be able to, I mean, because we share the Google Drive, there might be some resource out there about your close to your research. I can probably share some part of that with you. Wonderful. They are writing also an uh, article about that too, article about Excellent. social emotional learning in like what has been done in, in the field of art education. So it's going to be great. Uh, you might be interested in that too. So I, that, that's really great. Uh, I'm glad I'm here in, in your room for, for this presentation. Me too, Thank and you. I haven't seen you in so long. It's great to see you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, curious, so you said reading group, is that exclusive to? It's, it's a, a the grant group. So, so okay. applying for uh, the Canadian society has great, the Canadian grant is called uh, SHCCC SHIC. And that grant is huge, like uh, probably like quarter million or something. So. So all you know, the, you know, those people actually I mentioned applying for that grant, mm -hmm. and then if next year. So, but in preparation, preparation for that, there are some like they are writing article in the middle, and then, and also they have done like a, the research about how to analyze social emotional learning in art, mm -hmm. in, in art in education. So it's, it's yeah, been, that might be the uh, same article that I'm I'm referring to too. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I read one that was recent. Oh, okay. Year. They, they are right now writing. So, oh, they're right now. Oh, there's another one. There's another yeah, one. Yeah, they are just working on that. It's a meta analysis <laughs> right now. So, so more update uh, I, will, I will share with you. Okay. Yes. Be in touch about it, please. That would be great. Thanks, Dr. Shen. Hilary, that's a really good uh, project that you're doing there. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you Lucy, and thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was interesting to see the children's work. I, I was just wondering, um, now that you say that uh, you are working on it as a, as a project, as your dissertation project, and uh, I see no. you're already sharing um, no, no, the children's no. work. So mm -hmm. did you hey. have to go through the IRB process? So because I'm not sharing their names or their specific any specific identifying information, I've been told that that's okay for educational purposes. Oh, okay. That may have changed recently and I may be out of compliance in which case, but I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Maybe Dr. Shin knows more. Well, actually, that's, as long as you don't you don't publish, that it's okay. The presentation yeah. might be okay, but if you make it as a kind of journal publication and book writing, and yeah. that means you need the IRB. So uh, IRB usually don't go ret retroactive way. So you uh, uh, future work you should apply for that. Anyway, when you write a dissertation based on this, anyway, you have to get all the, the new proposal and everything has been new. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and yes, even when we at the schools, when we use the children's artwork in um, exhibitions like public displays, we always get signed release forms. Um, but because this is, you know, I'm not identifying them or who or where they are, um, I've been told that that's, that's acceptable for a presentation. Okay. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so Thank much, you Lynn. So much. Thank you for joining everyone. It was great to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. You're amazing. Thank you for such good questions. Um, this is it. This is the last of Emerging Conversations for this year. So thank you for closing us out. Um, we are so happy to be done.